Hi, and welcome to the story of cooking. I'm Sarah Nicholas. This show explores people and their unique story of cooking. It will be a historical journey as well as a culinary experience. Each week we look at a different group of people and their unique story of cooking. You don't have to be a four star chef, you just have to have a love for cooking and an interest in history and you can create this meal in your own home. This week we're going to be looking at high tea. High tea traditionally um, is not this social elite gathering. It actually was a meal for the working class. Uh, people would have a long hard day at work, they would come home and they would enjoy dinner and that was that was the high tea. So it's actually a very heavy meal as opposed to what we think of high tea as being. So the first thing we're going to start with is called poacher's pie. This would have been something very traditional that the English would have had for dinner or high tea at the end of a work day around 5 p.m. First thing we're going to do is start with our chicken. We have boneless, skinless uh, chicken thighs, so we have dark meat. They probably wouldn't have used chicken thighs um, back in the day, but um, would have used whatever they had available. But we're going to use chicken thighs because I think they taste really good in this dish. So I'm melting four ounces of butter in my pan. And to that, I'm going to add my chicken. So I said high tea. Um, isn't what we think of high tea as being today. What we think of high tea as being is actually traditionally called low tea um, or afternoon tea. That's what we think of as high tea being today. But I think Americans call it high tea because high sounds more regal, right? Low tea doesn't sound very prim and proper or social elite at all. Um, they call it high tea because you actually eat it at a high table or a nor your normal kitchen table, but a higher table as opposed to low tea that was served on coffee tables, you know, in your sitting room or drawing room. So that's the difference. And then at low tea, obviously, that was for the social elite, and that was eaten earlier in the day. It wasn't a meal. It was a pre-meal to their dinner. Okay, so I'm just chopping it up. We're going to brown it in the butter. And this is the base of our poacher's pie. My knife's not very sharp. I'm struggling. Okay. And I have four breasts, or sorry, four chicken thighs. So we are just going to round the meat for a few minutes. And to that, we are going to add the rest of our filling. After that browns for a second. We're gonna start with bacon. Already cut into lardons. Little strips. See how hearty this meal is? And our fennel. And we're just using the bulb of the fennel. Um, you can use the I like I actually love fennel. It tastes like uh, anise or licorice. Um, but we're just using the bulb, which is the bottom of the fennel. And you can use the tops, um, the green parts as well. People don't use them very often, but you could, you could throw those in there as well. Just cooking that a little bit. All right, the next thing that are going to go in are two garlic cloves. Peel them. So high, tea is actually kind of an interesting thing to study. I didn't even I realize kind of what I was getting into when I started doing research for this episode because I really, I thought high tea was exactly what everyone else thinks of high tea as being. Um, I found out quickly that that was not correct. But also, um, tea itself is kind of a very controversial thing throughout history. And that, that history, history of tea alone is interesting. Um, obviously, tea came into the world through China back in uh, 2737 BC, um, and they used it a lot for medicinal purposes, which they still do uh, today. Um, and English actually, we'll get to this a little bit later, but the English actually were not the first to have this idea of taking tea um, at the end of the day. Um, in the 17th century though, when it did become popular in England, it was 
super popular, and there were actually 500 tea houses in London alone. So there were probably more tea houses than there were taverns, believe it or not. Okay, so I just added some garlic. I'm gonna add some shallots. You can add onions, but I like shallots because they're a little sweeter. This is kind of like a pot pie, I guess, we would think of. I was going to add four shallots, but now that I'm looking at it, I think two's probably plenty. And also, I found out that there's actually over 2,000 different types of tea. And it's actually also the national drink of Iran and Afghanistan. Which who knew? I thought it was just the national drink of England. Alright, olives. I'm gonna add olives. I'm not sure if this was traditionally English, but it should be your new tradition because these taste really good in this pie. You can use any kind of olives that you like. I just have green olives, obviously take the pit out of them. Um, black olives would be fine. Just top them up and throw them in. You can make it as chunky or as small as you wish. Um, tea has actually been really controversial in America as well. Um, I'm sure we've all heard of the Boston Tea Party and how um, the tea was so heavily taxed and expensive in America the time of the uh, colonialist. So, tea's also also been the center of a lot of controversy, as well as being an enjoyable drink. All right, we're gonna pop some carrots in there. A lot of ingredients, huh? And then lastly, we're gonna finish it with some thyme. We're getting kind of big. I need all those. Some thyme. You can use fresh thyme. Just pull it off the sprig like so. You can use dried thyme as well. And then we're going to add a little bit of uh, booze to our poacher's pie, which is also very popular. In fact, the um, Europeans specifically in England had two meals. They had breakfast and then they had dinner or breakfast and high tea. And for breakfast, they would even drink alcohol. They would drink um, ale with their breakfast. I'm gonna add a cup of white wine. Um, sherry would have been popular in England. A cup of white wine and some chicken stock. Lastly, you just want to season it up a little bit with some salt and some pepper. And you want this to cook down a little bit so some of the wine cooks out and the vegetables get a little soft. But it's going to bake in the oven, um, so that will happen in the oven as well. All right, let that go for a second while I prepare my crust. Um, you can make your own crust. I have not done that today. We're using pre-made pie crust, which is is fine, but if you're ambitious and want to make your own crust, that's good too. All right, so you just take a pie pan, roll out the bottom layer of your pie. Okay, looks like it might need a few more seconds. It's a little too liquidy right now. All right, so this looks like it's cooked down enough. It's ready to go into our pie. Just dump it in there. Another steam facial. Okay. Dump it in there, spread it out, and just grab your other pie dough and roll it out on top. And just crimp the edges however you like it. Make it as pretty as you want. I don't really care as much about food being pretty as it being delicious, so I'm just rolling the sides over. All right. 
And then you want to also vent the top as well. Was there? And then just cut little slits. You can make a pretty design if you want. Um, I'm sure they did not care about it being fancy. They were just tired at the end of the workday and wanted to eat. Okay, we're gonna pop this in the 375 degree oven for about half an hour. Most of the inside's already cooked, just you know, softening the vegetables and browning the top and we'll be good to go. I'm gonna get this area cleaned up and when we come back, we will make our barm brock. Welcome back, we have everything ready to make our barm brock. Barm brock is actually a traditional um, Irish bread. It's made with candied um, fruits and it, it's similar to soda bread. If you, most people are familiar with soda bread. This is kind of like a um, fruitcake soda bread. So the first thing we're gonna do is start with tea. This uh, bread is actually made with tea, which makes it perfect for a high tea meal. Just put that into hot water. And let it steep for a few minutes. Off, you can turn the heat, once the water's hot, you can turn the heat off. Then we're going to start with our dry ingredients. It's going to be flour, self-rising flour or AP flour. Um, if you use AP flour, you're going to want to add baking powder and baking soda. This was AP flour, so we're going to do that. All right, so our tea looks ready. You want a strong tea. You can just take the tea bags out. And to the tea, we are going to add, whoops, the fruit. We have golden raisins. Citron, candy citron. You can use whatever kind of candied fruits you like. Um, I just like these two, these two kinds. You can use raisins, um, citron, orange, candied orange. What, what you would think of as putting in your fruit cake in America. So those are going to rehydrate. Um, tea didn't actually come to England until around six, the late 1660s when um, King Charles married a Portuguese woman who was obsessed with tea. And she made it in vogue to drink tea in England. So it was actually a little bit after the French um, that tea became in vogue. Uh, we're gonna add a little sweet sweetness to our dry ingredients. We're gonna add some light brown sugar. It's one cup. We're gonna add one teaspoon of cinnamon and a half a teaspoon of nutmeg. Maybe a pinch of salt as well. Okay, let's mix all of that together. So, Queen Victoria actually had a lady in waiting. Her name was uh, Anne Stanhope. She was the Duchess of Bedford. And she actually was the first person that started having afternoon tea. Um, she, again, around you know three or four o'clock, she would get the sneaking feeling in her stomach because dinner was being served much later um, than it was before. It was served late in the evening. So around three or four o'clock, she would get very hungry. And so she started inviting people over to have tea and scones and what we think of as being afternoon tea or low tea to this day. They, she would send out these elaborate invitations that would say, come to my, uh, I think it was Belvoir Castle, come to Belvoir Castle for tea and walking in the fields. So we can credit the Duchess of Bedford for low tea, what we think of as high tea today. All right, I'm gonna add one egg. Just whisk that up a little bit. Add it to our dry ingredients. And then we're gonna add our fruit cool down a little bit. You don't want it too hot because again, we just added an egg in there, so you don't want the egg to scramble. Um, but you can see it's been rehydrated and it's plumped up a little bit. Okay. Just pour that in there. And just give that a stir. Mix it all up. Tea also was really popular because Queen Anne in 1700 actually decided that she was going to, instead of drink ale, she was going to drink tea for breakfast. So it became even more popular with, with Queen Anne. So you can see that uh, flour gets really soaked up um, 
into the batter. You want it to be kind of thick like this. You don't want it to be runny. It's the consistency of what you would think of a fruitcake being or Irish soda bread being. Okay, so now we're gonna take our pan. You can do it in, you can do it in this kind of pan. You can do it in an eight inch uh, round cake pan, whatever you like. But the important thing to remember is to grease it really, really well. So I'm just gonna take some butter and grease the pan. So I think every little girl in America always had tea parties when she was growing up. I was no different. I have uh, several different little tea sets. Again, I thought I was having high tea, but I was actually having low tea um, with all the little pastries and that kind of thing. It's really popular on you know, bridal showers, wedding showers, that kind of thing. Or Al Alice in Wonderland and the Mad Hatter themed birthday parties. It's very sticky. But that's how we want it. All right. You just want to spread it out evenly in the bottom of your pan. So sticky, it's even hard to spread, huh? Do the best you can. It'll spread once it heats up in the oven as well. Okay, so this is gonna go in an oven at 350 for about 40 minutes or so. And it should be firm to the touch and slightly golden on the top. And then the last thing we're gonna do is we're actually gonna make it even a little more sweet by brushing it with honey. Almost there. So this bread would be good for dinner or breakfast or this is actually a good holiday um, recipe as well. But definitely something classical that you would have eaten at a high tea it's more of a hearty bread than the little scones or pastry or finger sandwiches that we think of today. So I'm going to pop this in a 350 degree oven for about 40 minutes until it's firm to the touch. I'm going to clean this area up and when we come back we're going to make our Welsh onion cake. Welcome back and we have everything set up for our Welsh onion cake. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to peel potatoes. All a Welsh onion cake is are potatoes and onion and a little bit of butter. So it was a very popular dish um, when you were taking high tea at the end of the day. Potatoes were a staple in a lot of um, United Kingdom diets because they were cheap and they were easy to grow. Okay. So I'm gonna peel and we're gonna pop them into water so they don't turn. So Tea etiquette is actually a kind of an interesting thing. Everybody always thinks of drinking tea with your pinkies up. That's actually doesn't even make any sense. The reason why people actually put their pinkies up originally were because the tea glasses didn't have a handle. So you would actually hold the tea glass with your thumb at six and your index finger at 12. So your pinky would automatically go up. So you would drink like this. So you weren't burning your hand holding the side of the glass. But now it's just a fancy thing to do, so people do it. Okay. I'll show you how we're going to cut these. I have one. This is a mandolin, and you're going to actually um, set it so you just get a really, really thin slice. It's easier to do it this way than slicing it really thinly yourself. But you have to be really careful. Do not get your fingers anywhere near the blade because it causes a nasty cut. So iced tea actually became popular in America. Um, the, probably credited to the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904. It was where they first started selling iced tea. But actually, I have to give a shout out to Virginia yet again. The first iced tea recipe was published in a old Virginia housekeeping uh, cookbook in 1837. So you can see these are slicing up really, really thinly, wafer thin. Don't go too fast if you don't know what you're doing. You're gonna cut yourself. And then when you get close to the bottom, put your hands up like this so you don't cut yourself. Okay. Next one. Same thing. 
So everybody's heard the phrase, not my cup of tea. Um, that actually came from England because England is actually associated with drinking tea is associated with having, you know, good manners and being an acceptable, having acceptable behavior. So when somebody is not your cup of tea, that means they're not behaving acceptably or in a rude fashion. That's pretty interesting. Okay. I'm gonna do a few more. Okay, last potato. We're gonna pop these in some water just to get some of the excess starch off of them and help them from turning color before I finish making my cake over here. Okay, so this cake actually can take a little while to assemble. It's got a lot of layers of potatoes and onions, kind of similar to um, scallop potatoes. So scallop potato pie. That's what we call it in America. Okay, so we're going to grease the pan. Some butter. The third ingredient that goes into this dish. Butter, potatoes, and onions. All right, we're going to start with a layer of potatoes. Just lay them out into the bottom. This actually makes a pretty presentation when you're all done, too, because it gets nice and golden, and you flip it out of the pan, and you cut it like a pie. It actually looks kind of pretty, even though it's so simple. Just layer in the bottom. Get the excess water off of there. All right. And on top of that, make sure you cover everything. You add some finely chopped onions, sprinkle those around. Okay. And then we add some salt and pepper. Season every layer. Because again, there's not much going on here. If you don't season, then you won't have much flavor. Okay, then we're just gonna take butter and just dot the top. Dot the top with butter. And then you just repeat. That layer's done, so we're gonna do the next layer. You're going to keep filling it up with layers, potatoes, onions, seasoning, Then we're just going to throw it in a 350 degree oven for about an hour and it should be, the potatoes should be cooked through, the onions should be cooked through and it should actually be able to flip and when we come back we will have all three dishes plated. Hi welcome back. We have all three dishes plated. We have our Welsh onion cake that just came out of the oven with all those nice layers of potatoes, onions, and butter. We have our Irish Brom back, which is very, again, very similar to a soda bread. We've got all those different candied fruits in there. Incredible. And lastly, we have our poacher's pie with our chicken, our fennel, and our olives, and the nice crispy golden crust. And there you have it, folks. Great spread for a high tea. Thank you for joining me on this chapter of the story of cooking. I'm Sarah Nicholas. I'll see you next time. Um.